I'm Will Hertzfeld, and I'm pastor of uh, Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Oakland. Bethlehem Church is a member of the Association of Evangelical Lutheran Churches. In addition to doing those kinds of, of things, I have other responsibilities in the church, some of which are new, at least beginning in September, when I will join doc Drs. Preuss and Crumley as one of the three presiding bishops of the church. We hope until the new church begins. Major issues, so that we are all at rest on this, will not prevent the new Lutheran Church from being born. There is no issue, in my opinion, which will prevent the beginning of the new Lutheran Church. In other words, all of the struggles that, that we might have between now and 1988 will not prevent the new church from being born. There will be problems and issues unresolved waiting for the new church to begin and waiting for the new church to solve them. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America actually uh, has a genesis that extends itself beyond, uh, that is backwards in time, uh, the event at Columbus. Uh, that is when the three presiding bishops uh, carried these, uh, some of you have seen the pictures, these 45 pound uh, water, water uh, jugs uh, to the baptismal font and and began pouring and then you know people uh, uh, have reminded me that the expression on my face was uh, was an expression uh, that said uh, something like uh, I may get a hernia or <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you think about these 45 pound water jugs and you uh, you, you figure that this particular symbolic act was designed for a six foot eight Aryan, and not a, not a five, five foot uh, seven black person. Well, the first racist act can be dated from the removal of the first Native American from his plot of ground. And this racist act set off like the domino series the expansion of white people westward from Jamestown all the way to Vietnam. The United States established and maintained for nearly 250 years the most brutal and dehumanizing slave system that the world has ever known, including those that I'm able to read about in biblical times, based exclusively on race. American slavery caused the nation to be established on the principle that all men are created equal to write a constitution defining slaves as three-fifths of a man. You've heard all that before from Leon and a couple of others. The slave trade itself was genocidal in that unknown millions of men, women, and children died en route here. Like much of American society, racism is a matter of subtle and not-so-subtle euphemisms. An elaborate rhetoric exists to disguise it, much of which you have heard here already if you have been listening from yourselves. What does it mean for a person to be the black sheep in a family? Is it true that only the good guys wear white hats? What color is devil's food cake? <laughs> what color do we talk about when we talk of death? All American white institutions are racist or are more accurately white supremacist and all operate to perpetuate white privilege. Some do more vigorously than others. Some manifest it differently. Some are more strategically located than others. See, you see, institutionalized anonymous racism means that many whites do not discriminate in any direct, overt way. Now, the inability or unwillingness of white people to recognize racism is excavated further by, by the lack of a tradition of systemic analysis or understanding of any social phenomena. Now, I believe that. Thus, the Horatio Alger myth, which uh, Brother Tweet talked a little bit about when he was reading from Mad Magazine this morning, combined with the Protestant ethic, decrees that failure by whites as well as blacks is either the fault of the individual or the work of God as a punishment for sin. In either case, the problem is an individual one. 
The more whites see of the conditions in which black people live, the more they tend to be convinced that this is what black people want or deserve. White Americans do not know who they are because since 1607 and before, they have constructed an identity that depends primarily on who they are not. Because of this, they have brutalized not only men and women of color, but perhaps irrevocably themselves as well. The black church was conceived in Africa. It was born in slavery in America. The black church's emergence came as a result of black Africans being stripped of their heritage and enslaved mostly by white Christian persons. We affirm whatever methods they decide best in their particular situations and make no pious and hypocritical judgments which condemn those efforts to bring an end to their oppression recognizing that we in this country have ourselves been compelled to make similar choices and may be so compelled again. Because of racism and imperialism, domestic and foreign, we black people are an international community of outlaws and aliens in our respective homelands and in those communities where we have chosen or been forced to reside. The loving servanthood of the black church has been and is today an inescapable necessity. Therefore, we do not reject the disinherited, for they are us. We do not reject the disenfranchised, for they are us. Rather, we embrace all of God's children who hunger and thirst for justice and human dignity. We rededicate and recommit ourselves and the black churches in whose leadership we participate to the struggle for freedom from injustice, racism, and oppression. This we declare to be the essential meaning of black theology as defined by those who conceived it, nurture it, and affirm it as a source of inspiration and reflective action for all black people and for all of the exploited and oppressed peoples of the world who are grasped by its truth for their situation. I'm told to say, whenever I conclude statements like this to all persons, welcome to the black church. We will be pleased to baptize you, except that this time it may be by immersion, even for Lutherans.